Well, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. And I know that for some of you, it's very early in the day. And for some of you, it's very late in the day. My name is Nicolo Singer. I'm the executive director of Asia Society Switzerland, joining you uh, from Zurich today. And I'm delighted to host this global members-only conversation with Tom Nagorski today, together with my colleague, Margaret Conley, joining us from San Francisco. To my knowledge, this is the first time that all Asia Society centers have collaborated on an event, and I think we have almost every time zone on the planet represented uh, in today's call. In the first part of today's event, you'll hear from Asia Society representatives from around the world asking Tom Nagorski all the questions they've always wanted to ask him. And then in the second part, we welcome, of course, your questions from the audience as well. You can either use the raise hand button um, if you want to ask your questions live, then we will turn on your microphone and camera and you can uh, ask the question directly. Or if you prefer, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your stream. You can type your question in and we'll read it for you. With that, let me now hand over to Margaret Conley in San Francisco for a short introduction of today's honored guest, Tom Nagorski. Thank you very much, Nico. Tom joined Asia Society as our executive vice president in October 2012, and for his first eight months, served as acting president of the institution. He came to us from ABC News, where he was managing editor for international coverage. Before that, he was foreign editor for ABC News World News Tonight and a reporter and producer based in Russia, Germany, and Thailand. As a journalist, Tom won eight Emmy Awards and a DuPont for excellence in international coverage. He also had a fellowship from the Henry Luce Foundation, is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He wrote a book and he got his degree at Princeton. Tom spent three decades in journalism, a field he has returned to now. And in his leadership roles, he was and still is the calm voice on the other end of the phone. Whether a foreign correspondent or a center director at one of Asia Society's 13 locations around the world. After over eight years with Asia Society, he leaves us with a strong content and programmatic legacy, as we'll hear shortly, with Asia 21 Young Leaders, Game Changers, and the launch of our Asia Society magazine. Thank you, Tom, for all you've done for our organization and for your friendship. Please welcome Tom Nagorski. Thank you, Margaret, uh, and thank you, Nico. But Margaret, that is uh, just about the nicest uh, uh, introduction I think I've received uh, anytime, anywhere. So uh, I really appreciate it. I'm humbled and it's great to be with uh, the global family again. Uh, and I, I, I hope it won't be, uh, I know it won't be uh, the last time. Um, I was asked to reflect a little bit on both Asia and the Asia Society. And uh, I thought I'd take a look back and it's, uh, uh, it's a bit of a, a, a sweeping look, but I promise it won't take too long because I thought it might um, help to just uh, put some perspective on the really staggering change uh, that has come to uh, that part of the world uh, over um, the history really of this organization. Uh, when I joined, um, as Margaret said, the terrifying period where I was uh, interim president, uh, Vishaka Desai had just left. And of course she gave me a lot of great counsel and she told me she had been for those who don't know, but I assume most of you do, our president uh, before then. She told a story uh, that has stuck with me, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, about the, um, uh, a World Bank forecast about Asia that was put forth uh, in the late 1950s, so not long after the um, uh, founding of the Asia Society, uh, in which, uh, among other things, uh, the World Bank forecasts that Korea, coming out of the uh, uh, then very recent uh, terrible war on the peninsula, uh, forecast very poor. Uh, Japan, about a decade removed from the Second World War, forecast very poor. Uh, China, described then as Maoist communist China, uh, never going to make it. India, grinding poverty, uh, same, right? About a, a decade or so after partition. Now, Vishaka's point was not just to say of the World Bank, you know, they get to check their forecasters a little bit, but also to heap praise on the Asia Society founder, uh, John D. Rockefeller III, uh, who saw enormous potential uh, taking the long view, not just for those countries, but for the continent writ large. And, and that had a lot to do with why he founded the organization. Fast forward about a quarter century. Uh, I'm not sure I've told uh, most of my colleagues that the first time I set foot at the Asia Society in New York uh, was when I was about to head off on that fellowship to Asia that Margaret mentioned. Uh, they had a lovely lunch on the eighth floor at 725 
Park Avenue for those of us who were going. Of course, all lunches at 725 Park Avenue are lovely things. And uh, the lecture, I don't remember who gave it, but the lecture we were treated to uh, was uh, about Asia's potential. And this is 1988 now we're talking about. Uh, and at the time, just to refresh memories, uh, we had the rise of what were known as the, the Asian tigers economically. In this country, in the United States, uh, all the news uh, on that front seemed to be about Japan taking over various American industries and what that might be like. Uh, I have to say China, not really in the conversation. And when I went as a journalist that year to Southeast Asia, uh, the big stories in that neck of the woods were very much uh, what was going on in Burma, uh, where there was a student movement that was cracked down brutally um, that fall. Uh, when we first, or at least I first heard about this uh, woman named Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, who was uh, taking a great many risks as, as a dissident and fighter for democracy. Uh, the Vietnamese uh, uh, occupation of Cambodia came to an end. That uh, was a huge story at the time. China, uh, kind of a back burner, which is just insane to think about now, until, of course, uh, we came to the spring and the protests in Beijing, uh, and then that awful Sunday uh, in June uh, of 1989, uh, when the news started coming in from Tiananmen Square. Uh, I jump ahead uh, now another quarter century. This gives you an idea of how old I am. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's when I joined in, in, uh, in late 2012. And uh, yes, uh, in the eight plus years that I uh, was with the organization, there was certainly obviously uh, great change and news events from India where Narendra still very much in the news and maybe not uh, for good reason at the moment. Um, Iran, uh, changes there, which the Asia Society was for a while very involved in. Uh, and again, uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, which uh, 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 has had its ups and downs. But it goes without saying, but I think is worth repeating just to capture the staggering nature of change uh, over these days to these sorts of events, uh, policy work, uh, current affairs programs. This time has been utterly and completely dominated uh, by China. Uh, and whether it's uh, discussions and events about the leadership about Xi Jinping, uh, about that country's territorial ambitions, uh, about the Belt and Road Initiative, about technology issues, trade wars, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Uh, one must hope that, I hope anyway, that that stays out of the news for all sorts of reasons. And of course, the various machinations in the US-China relationship. Uh, we used to say, those of us uh, involved in these programs, um, that you could, you could have events where China was not the subject of the event, where there were no Chinese speakers or speakers about China, and yet somehow, China uh, has always wound its way into the conversation. Um, as for the Asia Society, uh, I'll just say this. Uh, yes, also staggering changes, uh, even as late as the late 80s when I uh, came for that lovely lunch, I think it was fair to describe the organization as a lovely, uh, almost boutique institution uh, catering largely to Americans and even maybe largely at the time to New Yorkers. Uh, who were interested in that part of the world. So the, uh, the just the sheer geographic growth has been remarkable, uh, not just with centers, but with initiatives and events, and of course, uh, the digital uh, age and what that has meant to, to the institution, um, but also in its impact, uh, which uh, I think it's fair to say uh, is, has, has multiplied uh, many times over in, in both the arts and culture and policy and so forth. And, and probably the Policy Institute uh, is, is the most dramatic and most recent example of that. But I will say this, uh, with all this change, I really think, uh, and I'll this will be the last point I make, uh, that there's a constant uh, when you go back to, uh, as, as many of us did when uh, the institution celebrated its 60th anniversary in uh, 2016, and you go back and look at what Mr. Rockefeller had in mind uh, what he wrote about and what he said at the time uh, about the mission and the vision. And those really have, have held true. And I think it's a great sign, not only of his foresight, but all the people 
uh, who have worked and now work at the organization, that uh, uh, it holds so true to that mission. And I also think it's true. And here you have to take my word for it because I'm no longer a big promoter. Uh, I don't work at the Age of Society anymore, so I'm technically an unbiased uh, speaker. I think the mission is as important as, as ever. I think the organization is meeting that mission as well as it ever has. And um, we used a phrase last year in conjunction, I think, uh, um, with the Game Changer Awards uh, coming toward the end of the, the terribly difficult year of 2020, uh, that, that the society was never more relevant. And I think that is absolutely true. And I will leave it there. Uh, back to you, Margaret, and thank you. Tom, we're always learning so much from you and you are always part of the family. Joining us now, the head of our Hong Kong Center, Alice Mong. Thank you. <clears throat> thank hi, you, Margaret. Alice. And thank, hi, hi Tom. Um, so good to see you again. Uh, I am on behalf of Asia Society Hong Kong, want to really say a big, big uh, thank you for your leadership. And, uh, you know, it's been great working with you this last um, eight years. And, uh, and I can't agree with you more. I think Asia Society, uh, and Asia Society Hong Kong, uh, which is celebrating our uh, 30th anniversary. And it's uh, the genesis was that event you talked about in um, 1989. So we're really excited that we are able to uh, kind of pay tribute and and um, to be part of this program and thank Nico for his for getting this started. And it is uh, really incredible to see the all the entire Asia Society family uh, be part of uh, kind of in some ways saying, paying tribute to you and, and say a thank you, a big thank you uh, for all that all that you've done this last eight year. But my question um, is uh, a bit um, kind of, it, it's, it's kind of a fun question. You have in this last eight years uh, hosted, helped us, um, the various centers as well as New York, uh, hosted programs and spoke, spoke to a, you know, a variety of people uh, from you know, heads of states to, to pop stars. So is there anyone that you, uh, particularly have geeked out over, um, you know, that, that you yourself have been really excited in meeting um, in, in terms of uh, and hosting the program. So that's my question. Geeked out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Okay. I'm glad you defined it because otherwise I might have struggled. Uh, yeah. Oh boy. Well, I, I mentioned the Game Changer Awards a minute ago. One of the things, and, and we only started doing it Notice I still say we, by the way, I'll continue to do that for a while. Uh, we only started doing that maybe three, four years ago where we would gather, in addition to having the big fancy event uh, with the honorees, uh, to have a program uh, on the day of or day prior where we would um, interview uh, on the stage the, uh, the game changers themselves. And uh, uh, I geeked out uh, over several of those. Uh, and put differently, I mean, I, you know, I enjoyed it. I got nervous about those those times, uh, but and it was inspired. I mean, I guess Dev Patel would be a a, a geek out example, not only because uh, he's uh, you know he's a film star, but he was just really a lovely, lovely human being. Who, by the way, was mobbed by uh, uh, by about a hundred young women when he came in the door. We almost couldn't get him to the stage, but that's a different kind of geek out. Uh, but all the game changers who, you know, San Amir from Pakistan, the cricket star, what an incredibly inspiring person. Um, speaking with Zhang Yimou, the Chinese film director, uh, actually Indra Nui, who uh, was until recently a trustee of the Asia Society. I would absolutely not hear tooting my own horn, but commend a one-on-one -on -one interview that I did with her. We asked her what she'd like to talk about. Uh, she had just that week, I think, or that month, just, uh, announced she was stepping down as CEO of PepsiCo, and she um, she wanted to talk about the role of uh, of family in uh, taking care of the elderly and the, this, what she described as the South Asian model. And it was a great uh, conversation. Um, Farooq Kathwari, maybe less known, the uh, the CEO of Ethan Allen. I interviewed him, uh, Josette interviewed him last year. I think the Texas Center recently interviewed him. Again, I commend to anybody, you know, his story is remarkable. And then the last one I'll mention, and I did not have the privilege of actually doing the interview, but in, in my mental archive here, uh, geek out is not the word, but when, when Malala Yousafzai, her father, 
uh, came to the Asia Society a few years back. Also, she, she was a game changer. And I, I, I highlight her father, who, who was so much a part of, of her, uh, her own life and his. Uh, and the interview they did is what we used to call must-see TV. And the beauty of it is it's still on the site, so other people can go get geeked out too. Thanks for your question. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, let's turn it right along um, and welcome James Gale, who is the Director of Programs at Asia Society Northern California, joining us from San Francisco as well, where it's still very early in the morning. Uh, James, hello, are you there? You may still be on mute. Hi there. There we go. Hi, James. Hi, Tom. Nice to see you. Nice to see that you're doing well. Uh, my you. question today is, um, what has been the most meaningful program you've worked on during your time at Asia Society? And also, why is that? Uh, um, well, yeah, I think... Here, my colleagues probably aren't going to be surprised by my answer. Um, so I would say the Asia 21 uh, Young Leaders Network. Uh, shout out to Sanjeev Sirchan and Hichang Kim if they're with us. Um, so uh, I guess I shouldn't assume everybody knows what that is. But um, about 15, 16 years ago, uh, you, you know, they, they say that um, lots of people want to take credit for a great idea uh, when it proves to be a great success and a great idea. Uh, as I understand it, it's a combination of Bashaka, who was then the president, Richard Holbrook, the late Richard Holbrook, who was then the chair of the Asia Society, Ronnie Chan in Hong Kong, all of whom had a version of the idea that about uh, engaging with the leaders of, uh, of Asia in business and the arts and policy and everything else. Um, they, uh, it, why not identify the future leaders and get to know them and engage with them? And that was the, the simple idea. Uh, personally, I got so much out of um, uh, the initiative and, and we would have an annual uh, summit gathering. Uh, and, uh, you know, you just got personally energized by that. Uh, I, I will never forget, actually my first trip for the organization was to uh, the Bangladeshi capital, Dhaka, uh, where we do not have a center, but uh, where that year's summit was. And I'll always remember riding in the back of the bus uh, with these uh, incredible young people, um, uh, you know, and, and Pakistani filmmaker, uh, an Indian entrepreneur. Uh, there was an Afghan journalist who was, I think, in his early 20s, who now runs a 24-7 news network in Afghanistan. So, but that's just... Back to Alice's question, that was a geek out thing for me to just get so inspired by these people. But more important, it had tremendous impact. And um, and I think that I'm very, very grateful, by the way, and, and, and pleased to see how much Kevin Rudd, our current president, your current president, uh, how interested he is in... Uh, uh, in the initiative, in capturing that potential, in turbocharging, you know, the next phase. But um, uh, they're a great group, and I encourage all, all members, centers. I know you already do this uh, to engage when possible with that network because it really is uh, it's a jewel uh, in the Asia Society crown. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Tom, also for coming out to Northern California when we hosted the Asia 21 Summit. And now to Manila, the Philippines, we have our chair, Doris Ho, and our executive director, Joy Alonso. Wow. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Hi, Joy. Hi, Hi Doris. Hi, Doris. And um, you. Joy, Joy and I are here in Manila. We couldn't miss this opportunity to express the amazing gratitude we feel for everything that you've done for the Philippine Center and for everything you've done for the Asian Society. And uh, we're gonna miss you tremendously. Joy, you wanna say something quickly? Yes, thank you, Doris. Well, Tom, uh, as, as Doris said, on behalf of Manila, thank you for all your support. And uh, we're a very lean team. We're a very small organization over here. And, but with all that you've done for us, it, we, we feel bigger than, anything else and so just like uh any other center uh, recently you came to support us for the asia 21 summit and so we 
appreciate all all the support and and help uh, you've provided. So I think we figured out the the question, and Doris has that for you, and she I'm turning it over to her again. Thank you, Thank Joy. You, Joy. Tom, um, with somebody like you, you have to think of a very important question. And I, I must say, listening to your, your story, and um, for me, it's always been inspiring to listen to you speak about your life as a journalist, in a way, covering the best and the worst of human experience. While at the Asia Society, you created and achieved very important initiatives like Asia 21, creating bridges of understanding between people, cultures, and with, I think, an important depth of understanding of why conflicts exist amongst people. You leave the Asia Society at a time when we are witnessing such massive challenges brought about by perhaps the growing dominance of China, questions about the future of liberal democracy against other forms, um, anger from inequities in every corner of the world. And now that you're returning to journalism and having lived with the Asia Society purpose for so many years. How will your approach to what you will pursue change? And how do you think the Asia Society can create, can achieve more meaningful ways to achieve its mission? Wow. Yeah, well, you, Doris, if your goal was to ask a really difficult question, I think you, you succeeded in your goal. Thank you. Before I answer though, let me just, Joy mentioned something that I think, uh, you know, global members, ought to hear, especially those who don't know the organization so well. She said lean team, right? And I just always, especially with the smaller centers, and that's most of them, uh, I just have always been blown away in a positive way by, you know, what the individual centers get done uh, with their lean teams. And so that's a, um, uh, that's just a plug to continue to support, uh, you know, wherever you may be, the centers uh, locally. Um, I would say, Doris, the thing I, I you know, take back to, to journalism now and um, is, uh, is, is maybe a just even greater humility about the things I don't know, which may sound strange. But, uh, you know, after I was in journalism for 28 years and uh, even a, you, you can be humble, but, but um, after all that time, you kind of think you know things, right? <laughs> And uh, my, my time, and I mean this in a good way, but um, has been just profoundly educational in, ad in addition to being inspiring and, and interesting. Um, I had never been to the Philippines before this job. Uh, I hadn't spent much time in Japan. I had never been to Australia. Um, and, and so it may seem trite, but uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, you need to... Uh, live and breathe places and get to know people and cultures before you can really, you know, you can read all you want, right? And uh, um, uh, I, I take away, I suppose it's what Mr. Rockefeller had in mind in terms of building understanding. Uh, I, I feel like my own understanding, and I still have a long way to go, but uh, has, has been improved greatly. And for the Asia Society, I just, you know, I didn't say much about the, uh, the Policy Institute and the team that, um, uh, that Kevin Rudd and, and, and another shout out to Deborah Eisenman, who was present long before Kevin Rudd, uh, what they have built there, because to your question about, and, and, and all those issues you mentioned, right? The, 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 the policy team, I think, has done a great job of not pretending it can or would dive into every single one of the challenges uh, that are out there. Uh, partly because actually, as think tanks go, they're a pretty lean team too, uh, but also because uh, they all recognize that there isn't much point or percentage in uh, taking on an issue or a subject if they don't feel they have something distinctive and special uh, to, to bring to the table. Uh, if, uh, you know, the giants of Brookings and CSIS and everyone else are, are pouring their huge resources into something, uh, no point. But um, uh, at the risk of, of repeating myself and sounding like a commercial here, uh, that group and the society writ large, I think are really, really well positioned uh, to, to get after some of those things you talk about. And um, I will be uh, on 
unbelievably super interested observer from the outside. Uh, I've actually said to Kevin and the team, I hope, uh, uh, you know, that there'll be some, some chance for collaboration because uh, I know that, you know, uh, between them and, and the organization and the Edge Society Network, uh, if I want to continue to learn and, and audiences continue to learn about what's going on in Asia, there's no better place to go. And thank you. Salamat. Thank you. And thank you again, Tom. And we will not say goodbye. We will see you no, again. No, no. Absolutely not. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Doris and Joy in Manila. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the executive director of Age Study Australia, Philip Ivanov, cannot join us today. Uh, for one reason, it's very, very late already in Australia. Um, but he says hello and he wishes he could be here. And he had a question that I really like, so I will ask it in his <laughs> name, Tom. Um, and it's something that I think sort of goes goes very well with with Doris's question and your answer. Philip's question is like, is Asia society really making a difference? What would change in the world if the organization weren't around anymore and we would not do our work? How would the world be worse off? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a good question. And I think it's one any organization has to ask itself. I, I, I come back, a partial answer is is the point I was just making to Doris. I think there is a discipline, and I, I take no credit for this actually, but there is a discipline that has come to the organization around making sure you are not just putting one more report on the shelf or one more interview with somebody who has been seen a hundred other places. Um, and so, I mean, off the top of my head, I would say uh, there's a lot that is not seen. I mentioned before that what, what was going on in terms of uh, Myanmar and, uh, and Iran around the time of my arrival in terms of what's typically known as track two or back channel work, there was enormous, uh, uh, important and, and unbiased uh, diplomacy, I guess you could call it, uh, that went on that had, had great impact. Um, I actually don't know all the ins and outs of it at the moment, but I know that between Kevin Rudd and Danny Russell and Wendy Cutler and Orville Shell, the task force that, uh, that Orville runs with scholars in the United States, um, the work of the Hong Kong Center, and on and on and on, uh, front-facing and not so front-facing, and then very quiet dialogue between the United States and China and other countries in China, uh, again, the organization, it, it's a, I don't need to tell this audience, a really, really, really rough time for the bilateral relationship. And then the those problems then spin into problems uh, in the region. And I think for the world, I don't think it's a jingoistic American thing to say that there probably isn't a more important bilateral relationship on the planet than the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, yeah. Can, can the Asia Society take credit for great progress there? No, because nobody can right now. Um, uh, but, you know, would the world be a worse place with the Asia Society gone? Without question on those fronts, but also uh, there is a litany and Sanjeev and I uh, have spent an awful lot of time trying to capture in the cleanest way possible. But my goodness, Asia 21 alone is responsible for so much good across the, the continent and actually the world. Um, and yes, those individuals, of course, exist without our having identified them, but the catalytic uh, impact of our bringing them together and the work they have done is hugely impactful. And then so much that's been done on the arts and culture front, um, uh, you know, um, what was it? Another past president, Nick Platts, used to say that and, and so did Mr. Rockefeller, that you couldn't either understand Asia well without understanding its history and culture, but you also, in a lot of cases, weren't going to get anywhere with all these thorny problems, many of which Doris Ho just highlighted, unless you use, Nick used to say, arts and culture as a wedge to get yourself into the conversation. That, by the way, is something that Brookings does not do and is not equipped to do, CSIS, all the great think tanks of the world, they don't have that lever and leverage that the Asia Society does. Um, it's, it's a cliche also perhaps, but, but the quote unquote trusted platform that the Asia Society provides. Uh, 
uh, is also something that uh, is is rare. It's maybe not unique. So, I, you know, I may not have nailed Philip's question, and I wish that's one I wish I'd had some, you know, uh, some preparation for, because I think my former colleagues can answer it better than me. But uh, I'll just say unequivocally, I think there's a term paper to be written, and it's a powerful one on how the world would be worse off if the society didn't exist. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, let's turn it over now to India. And joining us from Mumbai is Inakshi Sopdi, the Executive Director of Asia Society India Center. Hi, Inakshi. Hi, Niku. Um, hi, Inakshi. So, hi, Tom. Um, on behalf of all of us at the India Center, I, I echo what I hear from all the other center directors. I want to thank you for your warmth and your support. Um, uh, especially for, you know, na uh, nurturing me when I sort of came on board just a couple of months ago. Um, I, I realized I had a bunch of questions, but you seem to have answered all of them. So <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more with what you have to say about Asia 21. I see a number of Asia 21ers from at least this part of the world tuned in. I see Rupam and Paresh and um, Arunabha and uh, couldn't agree more with with just this wonderful community that Asia Society has created. But I wanted to sort of change tack and ask, you know, get you to pivot from this very sort of serious conversation to ask you uh, to share some of your fun memories over the years with Asia Society. You know, you revealed one of them to me when I was talking to you after my art awards about, uh, you know, how do you, in spite of your best intentions, there's always Murphy's Law at play and some, some little element always goes a little out of control. And you spoke to me about stepping on someone's toes, well, literally, uh, as an example of an experience that you had at one of your Game Changer Awards or whatever. But I'd love to hear about some fun memories, uh, you know, over your tenure at Asia Society. Okay, well, I'll give you a good one. <laughs> there, there, you're right, there are many. Um, first of all, I didn't just step on someone's toe. I stepped on former First Lady Laura Bush's toe. Uh, so, and, and yes, that was at the Game Changer Awards. She was uh, uh, there to, uh, to present the award to the Global uh, Sesame Workshop for their uh, work uh, with children in Asia. And, and anyway, that's that's... That story is just what it is, and she was incredibly gracious about it. But those of you who know me know uh, I, I'm a big person, and you just you wouldn't want me stepping on your toe, no matter who you are. Um, but in the same vein, uh, I mentioned Indra Nui before, who was a game changer, I think, in 2018. The year doesn't really matter. Uh, and Bill Clinton presented to her. And uh, people who know or have read about the former president uh, may know that his uh, his relationship with uh, uh, schedules and timing and all that it was never great even when he was president so he had agreed to show up and i think the event was starting at seven and, and you know and we couldn't really get going without it and his uh, his aide uh, comes and grabs me and says the president will be here in five minutes he needs to be gone at 7.30. Uh, and the guy was really rude. He said, I'm saying 7.30, do you understand? I said, I know what 7.30 is, I understand. Well, let's get started. First of all, we couldn't get started because President Clinton, obviously a lot of people wanted to chat with him and then he was just chatting with everybody. And, then, and the aide kept coming to me and saying, we have to have him out of here at 7.30. I said, fine, get, get him, he's over there, he's your guy. This, we have to, we'll get started. He, I'm not going to go break up his conversation with Mayor Bloomberg or whatever he's doing. So finally, uh, much too late, we get President Clinton ready. And uh, he, uh, he, he couldn't have been nicer. He gives a beautiful talk uh, about Indra Nui. And uh, that aide is staring at me the whole time in the back of the stage. And... Uh, and maybe he finishes at 7.35 or 7.40. So I figured, you know, we did okay. And the program rolls on and uh, I'm, I'm finished worrying about the president. And I, at least a half an hour later, I see a familiar, his very silver hair standing off in a corner. 
and he's talking to our then trustee, Ambassador Caroline Kennedy. And it's like 8.15. And I, I find the aide and I said, you know, and the poor guy who had been quite rude to me, he said, yeah, well, you know, I mean, it was his problem now. There was a break in the show. I go to have a bite to eat. I come back and President Clinton, now it's, it's I don't know, it's like almost nine o'clock. And there's Bill Clinton chatting with some guests about, I still remember the, the Texas Senate race, Beto O'Rourke and Ted Cruz. And he was having very engaged conversation about why he thought, unfortunately for him and the Democrats, that, that O'Rourke would lose. And he looked at me, he said, how's the show going? I said, it's going, going great. And that aide who was sitting in the corner after the 7-3-0, I don't know when Bill Clinton left or when he, but uh, so I'm not sure that's what you had in mind, but uh, there, there were a lot, as there are in journalism too, a lot of sort of behind the scenes um, uh, things that are both uh, stressful sometimes, but uh, uh, fun after the fact. Nice to see you, Akshay. Thank you. And now joining us from our Houston, Texas center, the president there, Bonna Cole. Tom, good morning from Houston. Hi, oh my gosh, you're going to be so missed. Um, on behalf of the Texas board and our team, we just want to acknowledge that you've been a tremendous resource. You've been that anchor of trust and support for all of us here. So we're going to miss you immensely. Um, um, please know that. But we will always continue to call you and bother you accordingly, wherever you're at. Um, my question for you is, I, I know you don't have a crystal ball, um, but you have such experience and knowledge of Asia. Where do you see Asia in the next two to three decades? Oh, uh, wow. Well, thank you. It's good to see you, Bonna. Um, but I not only don't have a crystal ball, I... Uh, uh, I'm just, uh, and I go back actually to uh, my opening remarks and that, that story that Bashaka used to tell about the World Bank is maybe a cautionary tale, but I, I really, um, uh, it's not false modesty, but I mean, I, I can't possibly hazard much even of a guess I, I, other than to say to the points made about China earlier, um, it's probably a pretty safe bet to think that, that the answers to that big, broad question will run through that country, um, how it deals with, uh, you know, it's now having some economic hiccups, uh, but more important, how all those questions of, um, of Hong Kong, uh, again, hopefully not, maybe Taiwan, the U.S. relationship, um, and, uh, uh, and then I think also climate change, which we haven't mentioned, uh, which of course is not an Asia-centric uh, issue, but uh, when we speak about India, I think often about how uh, that country we're now, you know, we used to worry in Asia anyway about air quality and, and emissions in China, and then China decided it was going to do something about it. And now I think it's fair to say that on any given day, you go to Delhi uh, and you're going to find uh, air quality indexes off the charts compared to Beijing. Uh, and of course, India, I mean, the, the situations are totally different, but, um, and then there, there are going to be the, the tensions and crises that we can't possibly forecast now, wherever they may come. And, and so speaking of forecasts, um, if you look at uh, the Asia Society magazine, the, the edition that came out uh, earlier this year, um, and uh, our, our title for, for the 2020 edition was The Year No One Saw Coming. And if you read the essay at the open uh, of that publication, it refers to the 2019 Asia Society forecast event that we had, which was forecasting the year ahead. And we had three brilliant, as we always do, it was one of the favorite things I did was the year-end forecast event. And you listen to what these three folks said about what they thought would be coming all over the continent in 2020. And it's almost not fair because right when they were talking in mid-December of 2019, there was this microscopic virus, you know, 
tearing through Wuhan and every place else, which wound up changing every single thing. And whether they were talking about economic forecasts or anything else, that's a long way of punting on your question. I really, uh, uh, I feel, I felt for those forecasters then, and um, uh, you know, I, I will, uh, I'll punt now, except to say one more thing. I think it's super important that this country, we haven't said much about the United States, um, uh, you know, get its act and its uh, diplomacy in gear, which, you know, is something you'll hear Daniel Russell, among others, uh, in Veyon. And I think it's it's spot on that not that the United States has to or should influence all events in Asia, but, um, uh, you know, a kind of uh, uh, a lack of competency on that front here can uh, can have a lot of detrimental effect. I'll stop there, but it's good to see you. Thank you very much. Um, I also have a question, and it's one that's been I with be me. I would stunned if you didn't have a question, Nico. Oh, I have so many, Tom, but I'm restraining myself. Um, so this is a question that's been with me pretty much since the point when I joined Asia Society. Uh, we're obviously the Asia Society. We talk about Asia all the time, including today. And it's occurred to me at some point that I'm not really sure how we define Asia. I know there's a UN definition, but that's really just a list of countries, right? And especially if you look at sort of where Europe ends and where Asia starts, there's a little bit of randomness into it. So my question is like, how do you define Asia? What is, is there, is it more than just kind of an, a list of countries that happen to be sort of in one particular corner of the planet? Is there something that you can sort of, are there defining attributes of Asia that you would highlight? Uh, interesting. D just, I'll take that in two parts. First, um, it was an interesting, it, one of the few things we never discovered <clears throat> in going through Mr. Rockefeller's papers and mission statements and everything about the organization was his definition. Because for, for again, reasons at least not known to me, and, and, and this persisted all the way into my tenure, the Asia Society sort of remit was, it, it stopped, um, its westernmost point really was Iran. And I remember uh, Joseph Sharon invited uh, a group of diplomats, uh, permanent reps from the United Nations for uh, a breakfast or a lunch uh, soon after she joined. And uh, there were um, there were diplomats from Turkey and Saudi Arabia in the room, and it was a private dialogue. But I don't think I'm sharing any secrets when I say both of them, who knew about this distinction, uh, the, the 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 Saudi uh, diplomat said, with respect, what, what continent would you say we are in, if not in Asia? And the the Turkish uh, representative said, you know, fairly bluntly that um, even as, you know, most school children when they study geography know that there's this cool little way that you can cross within one country from Europe to Asia and that country is Turkey. Okay, and by the way, you can say it in Russia too. So that was what led to the redefining strictly on a definitional geographic thing where the society now takes, as you said, the UN definition that reaches from the Pacific to the Mediterranean. The broader, I think, point you ask about defining characteristics, I, I, I don't think that's, uh, my own view is it's, uh, it's, it's almost not appropriate to suggest that there are any. And uh, back to uh, Doris's question about, you know, what one, has, one learns from all this work and travel, if anything, it's just, cemented in my mind what is known again to many of you that my goodness the differences between nations and cultures across asia are so profound uh and um yeah sure there are some things that are more common in asia than there, they might be in uh, uh in the united states Certainly, the uh, the interesting discussion I had within Vernui about the way that young people uh, in parts of South Asia are, you know, in instinctively or taught to take care of the elderly. The sense of community in China. I mean, but I think trying to 
define such things gets you on a real slippery slope where you just find all sorts of exceptions to the rule. And I'm reminded as you ask the question, I mean, it's a really good question, but uh, uh, my, uh, we took a wonderful family trip about five, six years ago um, to, uh, to the Serengeti uh, in, in Africa. And I remember my son who was, he was, I think 14 then, he got so annoyed with me when we, uh, we came back and we're talking about our great trip to Africa. And he was like, dad, you know, we, we, we went to Tanzania, we didn't go to Africa. And in a way I feel the same way uh, about, about the question, if that makes sense, but thank you. Next up, joining us from Seoul, Korea, our executive director there, Yvonne Kim. Hey, Yvonne. Hi, boss. I do not hear Yvonne. <laughs> Hi, boss. Can you hear me now? I, I was never your boss, and I'm certainly not your boss now, well, but nice to see you. I'm so used to calling you boss, and I'm going to continue calling you boss. You helped us get through so many K-dramas of our own and you will forever remain as a boss in my heart. It's good to see you, nice, Tom. We nice miss you tremendously. By the way. Yeah, you are like right here. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, it feels like only yesterday that we took the group trip to the DMZ and you almost broke your back in one of the tunnel. And I'm not sure if you remember this, this is the oh. souvenir you left for me when you were leaving Seoul after attending South Korea's 18th President Park Geun-hye's presidential inaugural ceremony in 2013. And you came back uh, with the trustees the following year, then again with Asia 21 in December 2016. And I understand that you had never visited Korea before you joined Asia Society. And you got to visit a lot of Asian countries during your time with the organization. So has your time at Asia Society changed your perceptions of Korea or Asia at large? And if so, how? Well, thank you, Yvonne. Um, sure, without question, it's changed uh, uh, perceptions. And, and in a way, I guess I've covered that in some of uh, the, the previous answers. I don't want to repeat myself, but I will say, just looking at that picture and your very specific question, um, you know, there are, and this may sound a little bit trite, but there are certain, uh, I think, places on the planet, again, back to an earlier point, where you can, you can read all you want and look at all the pictures and uh, even have like a virtual visit or what have you. And, and there's just absolutely zero substitute for going and seeing it. Um, and the demilitarized zone there was, was certainly, you know, in that category. I, um, I found it actually really profoundly depressing, uh, not, you know, for the obvious reasons of the division that it lays bare, but just the kind of weird theater of it. Um, and uh, so I don't know that I learned much more in that way, but, uh, you know, I used to say in the Middle East that um, uh, the Gaza Strip, is another one where you can read all you want about uh, just how small uh, and how um, uh, crowded uh, and how uh, impoverished the place is. I, I'll never forget going there for the first time and having seen so much trauma and violence and everything else. It's as if I, I, I sort of driving through south there and you look to your left and that's what you see and you look to your right and you see the Mediterranean and you see fishermen and you see people bathing and you see lovely fish restaurants and not that the Gaza Strip is you know it didn't make me think that oh it's a you know it's a, it's a wonderful prospering place it isn't but um, again it was just an example of no substitute for being there um, and uh, I would just say more broadly, the time in Korea beyond the DMZ, uh, it just the same as, as going to all these places, uh, you know, meeting a lot of people. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed I mean, my time with you, obviously, uh, my brief time with uh, the, the Korea chair, uh, Shin Dong Bin. Um, uh, YJ Kim uh, hosted a lovely uh, uh, dinner uh, once with me. I mean, so, so those are the things that really... Uh, helped me to learn, um, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. 
Thank you very much. Um, before we turn it over to the audience questions, we have one last uh, person from uh, the Age Society team, Sanjeev Surchan, um, Director of Global Initiatives based in New York. Um, oh, now I'm really nervous. All right. I think you shouldn't be. Sanjeev, are you here? There you go. Sanjeev, before you ask your question, maybe just briefly let me remind the audience that if you do have a question, and we've already received some great ones, you can type that into the Q&A box, but you can also raise your hand if you want to sort of join us here on the virtual stage and ask Tom a question live and make him more nervous, you can do that. Um, but now, first, Sanjeev, please. Thank you, Nico. Namaste, Tom. Namaste. Completely echo the sentiments that have already been shared by our global colleagues about your leadership. And I personally cannot thank you enough for your support and friendship. Tanevan. As for my question, I would like to take you back to your loose fellowship years, your days, and your first trip to Asia. Is there one memorable incident, moment, you still talk about from your first trip to Asia, and why? Mm. I'd like to end with a special shout out to our Asia 21 alumni who's joined this program. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev, and thanks for all, all you do and have done for the organization. Um, Rachel Cooper actually reminds us in, uh, uh, in the chat box here that you were instrumental in the uh, I mentioned Holbrook and Bishaka and Ronnie, but you were instrumental in the creation of Asia 21 as well, so that's off. Um, I actually first went to Asia in 1980 um, because I had a cousin who was a journalist based in, in Hong Kong at the time. But um, I, I would say in, in answer to your question, it was during that, that year, because when you're a journalist yourself and not just a tourist, you, you, know, you see perhaps different things. Um, and so my answer would be, <clears throat> I mentioned the, the, the news from Tiananmen in June. What the fellowship I was on, um, we had a modest stipend for travel. And the moment that that news broke, we were told, I guess for insurance reasons or what, we were not permitted to go, um, which my journalistic you know, uh, instincts would have been to, to go over to, um, uh, to China. Uh, many of you will remember Jonathan Karp, uh, former uh, executive director in Los Angeles. He was a journalist and a friend um, from university. And uh, so he and I decided instead, um, he was meeting me in Bangkok, let's go, let's try to get visas for Burma. And uh, without boring you with a terribly long story, so this was um, about six months after the crackdown uh, there, which of course got much less attention than what happened in China. Uh, but it was really rough. Uh, at the time, um, gatherings, I think, of more than three people anywhere. And, and, you know, if you've been to Rangoon, now Yangon, there are gatherings of 100 people all over the place. But gatherings of three or more people was cause for arrest. arrest. And Aung San Suu Kyi was not just, you know, saying things that were putting her at risk, um, but she was hosting or leading rallies where thousands of people gathered. So my most memorable time in that year certainly was a week or 10 days that we spent um, uh, in Rangoon, as it was called then, uh, you know, and, and, and Burma was, this was not just 1989, but Burma seemed like a place trapped in the 1950s. So communication, you know, I don't even remember exactly how we reached Suchi and her people, but Jonathan and I had both a very, uh, I would say, dicey encounter uh, in, in a street where, you know, the army showed itself at one point when they weren't happy. I mean, I don't think we were ever really in danger, but it was, uh, it was a frightening thing. And I remember we sort of ran into a noodle stall and just hung out there for a couple of hours because that seemed the smart thing to do. But then ultimately, after doing a lot of work in journalism around the country, uh, we wound up uh, with an invitation to the villa where Miss Suchi was living at the time. And we had about an hour with her over tea. Um, and our interviews, his was for Reuters and mine was for the Nation inter uh, newspaper in Bangkok, were among the last she was able to give before she was placed under house arrest. And of course, she has, uh, as you all know, uh, wandered 
it's from sort of that halo of dissent to the triumph of, of her freedom to something very different now that we don't have to get into. But that taught me a lot about journalism in difficult circumstances, uh, interviewing and, and uh, not to mention back then the difficulty of getting film on a plane, which sounds like ancient history, right? Uh, there was no texting and no anything. Um, I had to find a tourist who would agree to carry a roll of film that could have gotten that person in trouble uh, back to Bangkok. So that's for all those reasons was, was really memorable. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, let me now uh, welcome Adrian Keller, uh, the chairman of Age Study Switzerland, who is joining us as well live. Um, and you should see him now. And he's joining us uh, also, I assume, from Zurich. Adrian, please go ahead. You're still muted. Adrian, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Okay, there we go. Yes, but you don't pre-mute me then. <laughs> Tom, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to join for a moment the long list of, uh, of people who are grateful to what you did, which is not just leadership, but uh, you supported us, of course, in Zurich, but you also upheld the standard of journalism. I lived in the States in the days of Cronkite, rather, and, and old Jennings, and I think you, you sort of seamlessly continue that. This is an ever more difficult proposition in today's world, and uh, I command you, of course, for upholding, upholding that, but ask you if you have any thing to give along for us to maintain this uh, and to navigate the treacherous road of news to fake news to no news to being uh, reprimanded or as we have seen a uh, sharp uh, sharp power being used against those who use the news but most of all i want to thank you and i hope you stay in touch with us thank you adrian well <clears throat> I don't know if your question is more about the Asia Society or about journalism, but I would say, you know, there's um, the bad news, uh, and, and I'm speaking from a U.S. perspective now, uh, you know, the bad news when it comes to the media is that the easy to, uh, the easy to watch, the easy to listen to, the sort of default things that pop up on your television or your, your radio and all that is, uh, my humble opinion, uh, just just basically quite poor journalism before you even get to the partisan issue. Meaning, uh, you know, there are programs uh, that have global in their title or world in their title, and they would never in a million years touch here, for example. Uh, I used to have meetings with Chinese diplomats who would say, be very concerned about how something is being covered in China. And I said, you know, your bigger problem, or when Xi Jinping was going to come to the United States, I said, your bigger problem is that the, the the mainstream media, by and large, is probably going to ignore your country. So, you know, that's issue one. The partisanship is the second thing. And uh, uh, someone years ago had the idea that uh, on the cable networks in the U.S. that uh, you had to have a point of view, <clears throat> which is OK. You know, there's nothing inherently wrong with points of view. But that, that was, in, in from the media standpoint, the beginning of a, unless you're having a fight and unless you're screaming at your audience, uh, uh, and if all you are doing is a kind of standard BBC, if you will, recitation of the events of the day, uh, it, it, you'll never make it. Uh, social media has only amplified that, uh, and so here we are. The good news, and again, it's a, it's a fight, in this country and in other parts of the world. Uh, I think the good news is that the, um, uh, you will find more and more people and entities, they may be smaller, that are pushing back against this and at least recognize the problem and are trying to do something about it. Uh, the, the, the thing I've joined, and um, it's not up and running and won't be until the fall, there is one word that most appealed to me in their pitch, uh, both to supporters and to, to new employees, nuance, okay? Now, I think most of what the Asia Society does at events and programs and discussions and all that is, is nuanced and sophisticated. Those adjectives don't apply to almost 
any journalism I can find anywhere, at least not in this country. And um, that is, it may be a very high mountain to climb, uh, but it is worth, uh, you know, um, it, it is worth the climb. And uh, uh, I actually intend, as I said earlier, to rely heavily on not just the Asia Society, but, but like-minded organizations who aren't afraid of deep dives, and um, as actually Peter Jennings, who some who you, you mentioned, used to say, just because you know you think something might be difficult to explain or complicated, your job as an editor or journalist is to go make it uh, as interesting and understandable as possible. Uh, and um, because the other road is just straight to simplicity and, and arguments and all the rest. As you can tell, I could go on and on about that, Adrian, but uh, maybe stop there. And it's nice to see you too. Tom, we have a written question from Selena Jaffrey uh, of the Programs Department at the Texas Center, Director of Business and Policy, who had the most impact on you during your time at the Asia Society. And if you could change something about Asia Society, what would it be? Oh, gosh. Um, most impact. I mean, I mentioned some of the most impactful programs. Um, uh, yeah, that's a tough one. I hate to single out staff, <laughs> uh, but uh, if I had to, um, I would say good old Sanjeev has uh, both as a colleague and, and the work we did together been high on the list. Um, and, and the leaders I worked with, both Josette and, and Kevin Rudd, uh, utterly different, by the way, in their backgrounds and their leadership, but uh, uh, and the center director. So I, I, you know, I find it hard to uh, to pin more than that. And uh, my apologies to all of many people I'm leaving out. Um, on the, uh, you know, what I might change. One thing I wished had changed sooner, and I wished I had changed, but I think circumstances changed is the true um, globalization of programming, which was a sort of, as you know, Margaret, a kind of slow evolution um, uh, that suddenly became a necessary sprint in 2020. And I mean, how many meetings and strategy sessions and program discussions did we have where we advocated uh, for greater collaboration um, for, uh, you know, one plus one can equal three or four, uh, for not duplicating this and in, in Zurich and in California and in Manila and wherever, try to figure out a way to, uh, you know, to do one thing. And of course the pandemic plus our push to a more digital strategy meant that something that I anyway had found was, was a tough one to push forward, uh, suddenly came forward and also, you know, um, one of the silver linings of, of a very difficult time. And I think the good thing there is that, uh, as you also know, uh, there's, there are now systems and there's, I think, you know, it's, it's in the DNA of the organization now to think, okay, how can we, uh, whatever center you work for, how can we satisfy the local audience, but also uh, make whatever we have in mind better um, by globalizing it? What you did recently, Margaret, and, and I guess continue to do with the whole issue of, uh, uh, of uh, violence and, and, and trauma in, within the Asian American community. For those who don't know, Margaret's been running a, a task force to uh, organize and coordinate the Asia Society response to that. It's been a great example of something that uh, that Kevin instituted, Margaret ran. Uh, but I think the good thing there was we really had started to uh, uh, have as a first order of business the collaboration uh, between centers um, to, to make all that work better and more powerful. And more better. All right, thank you very much. Um, we had another uh, person raising their hand um, and asking a question, but I've been unable so far to um, get them here. Let me just see whether I can just um, allow them to talk. Mickey, 
um, if you can hear me, now would be a good time to unmute yourself and ask your question, please. All right, that does not seem to work. Let's um, turn around to uh, another written question and we can come back to Mickey um, if, uh, if she still has a question. So there's one uh, that I thought was interesting um, and it goes, thanks Tom for stressing the importance of actually visiting another country and trying to understand its people and culture. With study abroad severely constricted both for American students and for international students hoping to come to the US, how should universities and NGOs like Asia Society help address the serious problem in the short and longer term? Um, well, I assume this is a, a China-centric question. Right? Uh, well, I guess I can't assume, but I'll, I'll take that on. I think uh, um, I think it's really important. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, the uh, there's a specific endeavor that comes to mind that is frozen at the moment, but I really hope unfreezes, which. Uh, uh, is not for students, but is for journalists in the United States that uh, Ahn Ping uh, on the New York team has been running uh, for more than a decade now, which has a very simple proposition, but I think a great example of a small thing that has been very impactful, which is three or four or five top tier journalists uh, in the United States who for whatever reason, but unfortunately this is quite common, have not been to or have not had much experience in China, but they are people of influence in the American media, are given the opportunity of a week or 10 day trip uh, to China with uh, really great deep dive sessions with officials across, not just officials, but prominent people in China, in the arts and culture, in politics and education, technology, et cetera, et cetera. All right, I think it's possible that we may have momentarily lost Tom. I at least can't hear him. I can still see him. Um, Tom, are you still with us? We need I'm we so sorry. That. Not sure what happened there. No worries, Tom. Um, let me suggest that we just go ahead and ask the next question. Margaret, do you want to do the honors? Sure. Question from Hugh Lester out in Northern California. Looking back on your career, Tom, what is a bias or misconception you discovered you had about Asia that you recently discovered? Huh. That's an interesting one. Um, bias or misconception. Uh, the Korea question puts that in mind. I'm not sure it was a bias, but it was a misconception uh, about, um, you know, just the geography, the the nature of and all that of the demilitarized zone. But that's, you know, um, I had, uh, uh, although this goes back decades and not recently, I, I certainly was, I had what is probably a typical American misconception that so much of at least East Asia uh, was um, was similar uh, in terms of the cultures and communities in each. I had a weird, you know, misconception on one of my trips to China. I think I went several times to China, and of course, I had been to China before as a journalist. And the you know much vaunted, incredible, meteoric rise of the country. I think I had I had the misconception that it had spread perhaps. Uh, more broadly internally than it had. And I was surprised on occasion to venture outside of Beijing or Shanghai and in different ways see the, um, uh, you know, if not poverty, just how far certain parts of the country, because you can get so overwhelmed in a positive way about the changes uh, that have come. Um, I'm trying to think, though, of a bias, and that's because that would be more interesting. And it's, and I don't mean to suggest that I don't have or did not have my biases. I probably still do, um, uh, but I'd have to, I'd have to come back to that. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pick the Europe question um, out of the ones that have been submitted since um, uh, we are in Europe here in Switzerland. It's coming from our good friend, Noel Clohane, who is based in Brussels. And Noel asks um, that it, it somewhat mystifies him that Asia Society has not yet expanded its footprint in Europe uh, beyond Switzerland. 
um, given that the same sort of Asia knowledge deficit that you had mentioned, Tom, for the US is also, yeah. of course, present in, in Europe. So any thoughts on why the Europe expansion has not yet accelerated and whether that may change soon, Tom? Sure. Well, I'll say two things. First of all, I think <clears throat> their expansion of any kind was a very, uh, I'm glad you asked that question, it was a really hot topic throughout my time. As a candidate for the job, I could not for the life of me understand why there was no Asia Society Japan, which there wasn't until just a few years ago. Um, and the notion of Europe wasn't really even on the table. But I learned in Indonesia also, by the way, you know, uh, um, has often been in the conversation. I learned that there was a, you know, the, the answer to that had nothing to do with the sort of, well, sure, there should be another center in Europe. Sure, there should be a Japan center. It had everything to do with practical matters of sustainability, um, you know, who the champions of the local endeavor would be. Uh, were we assured that it could therefore get off the ground and not just, uh, you know, be gone in a couple of years? Um, and uh, um, in the cases of Switzerland and Japan, which were the two centers launched on, on my watch, what was really impressive and very different models, by the way, was the way in which uh, in, in each case, I mean, we from headquarters helped with sort of, I would say, almost a checklist, make it sound really simple, of here's what really needs to be in place so that we know that it's sustainable. We know, by the way, that it's not just a vanity project that somebody has that they want to do locally uh, and so forth. And um, uh, the Swiss and, Jap and Japan models, for a long time, there, there was nobody in Japan who was willing, you know, either a company or an individual to step forward and be, you know, those one or two champions. And to the great credit of James Kondo and Terry Porte in Japan, uh, who, who uh, are trustees and, and, um, uh, and, and run the center from a board level there, they went with a different model of just looking for lower level supporters and getting a whole bunch of them as founding members, um, I think 30 or so. And that was their path to sustainability. And then they got a place at the International House in Tokyo. Um, and then the other thing that happened was, of course, a fundamental question, which has nothing to do with the practical thing, which is in the digital age, what do you need a bricks and mortar building in a center for, right? And that was before COVID and before everything else. And that's an ongoing conversation. Uh, and there are those who feel, as the questioner does, that there ought to be far more. And I can tell you that there have been, I don't know that I'm speaking out of school, but uh, I have been approached in my time, we have been approached by people from uh, Scotland, from Milan, from Karachi. I am sure I'm forgetting many places, all with an interesting and you know proposition. Uh, the one that has legs at the moment, and I you know I, I don't know the latest uh, on this is France, um, and uh, and it is a process. But I think the the answer is not that somebody has said, oh, strategically it makes no sense to be in that part of the world. The answer has always been, uh, we better be sure that that the build out of it is ready to go because the last thing anybody wants to do is launch a center somewhere with bricks and mortar that in a few years time might have to close up shop. Tom, last question here, and it's from Brom Cole. It's in two parts and you sort of answered the second part. So I'll start with that one. Uh, given the rapidly evolving nature of Asia, is the society paying enough attention to emerging countries such as Vietnam and Indonesia? And the first part of that question is, do you feel that Asia society's present footing is well balanced between policy, arts, and education? Right. Well, the first part is, is a hard one because there you, you run into, and I think I would defer to, to folks both in the arts and culture and the policy teams. I think uh, uh, that it's almost, for the reasons we've we've talked about, if you're the Asia Society in this moment in time, whether you like it or not, you really ought to pay a great deal of attention, especially on the policy side, uh, current affairs side, to things that not necessarily in China proper, but 
related to China. And that sucks a lot of the oxygen out of the room or pure metaphor. Um, but, uh, th you know, through the arts and culture uh, and through other endeavors of the policy team, they've been very mindful of, at least with India, you know, uh, making sure that that balance is there. Uh, our uh, co-chair of the global board, uh, Ambassador Chen Heng Chi, uh, great, uh, you know, one of the great Asian diplomats from Singapore, uh, is very mindful and on us. We're, we're believed having a major uh, summit in Singapore uh, when the travel restrictions uh, make it possible, uh, but, but mindful of keeping, you know, that giant thing called ASEAN and the geography of ASEAN in the picture. Uh, Asia 21 also allows us not to harp back on that because there's, you know, there is almost no geography to Asia 21, um, but there is a multiplicity of, of, of geographies. Um, and then the second question about the work itself, um, I know Kevin Rudd is very mindful of this because what has happened under his leadership of the Policy Institute uh, over what's it been five, six years, you know, what used to be, I used this word before about the whole organization, policy, you know, arm itself used to be kind of a boutique thing also. And it is now, I mean, you would never have called it a think tank before Kevin came on board, before the build out, Danny, Wendy, the fellows around the world, the ASPE Council and so forth. It's a, it's a, it's a big, you know, and very impactful, and we should all be super proud of it, enterprise. Um, and the arts and culture team has, by the way, a fantastic uh, new champion and leader in Michelle Yun Mepplethorpe. Um, but it has not, you know, uh, it, it's done super well and done great work and just concluded, by the way, in the most difficult circumstances imaginable, the first ever uh, triennial of Asian art. Uh, but it's not had that meteoric growth and rise that the policy side has. And uh, as, as arts and culture organizations across the world are aware, the pandemic punished arts and culture because it is such a public thing. Sure, we can, and we did have great virtual tours, but in some ways, the, you know, the in-person thing was so much more important, whereas a lot of the policy work, if not all of it, could be done the way we're having this discussion now. Uh, and Kevin is very mindful of that and, uh, and you know, to sort of make sure that that balance is kept or restored. Um, so that's a good question, and I think it's a focus as well. All right, Tom, thank you very much. I think that brings us to the end of today's conversation. We know you have a, uh, a thing you need to go to in a few minutes. So again, thank you so much, not just for, of course, joining us today and answering all these questions, but for all your service to Asia Society for everything you've done, not just for the organization in the US, but globally. Um, I did notice that through the entire conversation today, you refer to Asia Society as we. I hope you continue to do that for a really, really long time. We can't wait to see you again, and we wish you lots of luck with your new um, exciting and, and I think still somewhat secret gig. We can't wait to see what it is. Uh, I've asked everybody who has joined us today to ask a question live to turn back on their video so we can take a virtual group picture. Um, let's just see. Uh, wait until everybody's done so, and then I will uh, take a screenshot. We have Bana there, Doris is back on, uh, and actually John Wong, you want to turn on your camera as well? Um, John has been uh, actually, the man behind uh, this. Yeah, and may I just say, because I, I mentioned a lot of names, uh, John Wong is, uh, is someone that not everybody across the network would know, uh, but a, a great stalwart, uh, you know, you talk about lean teams, uh, almost every a uh, great program done out of the New York Center has his imprint on it as did this one. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody for having joined us for all your fantastic questions. Uh, Margaret, thank you so much for uh, co-hosting this. John, thank you for doing all the back end things. And of course, again, Tom, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day um, and joining us again to answer all our pressing questions. We would have said so many more. Uh, we'll email them to you. Um, okay. I hope to all. see you all really Thank soon, you. not just on Zoom, but live. Um, until then, take care. Thank you.